Chapter 3, Section 1, Amino Acids. When you look at the amino acids, we should notice that all of the 20 common amino acids, all amino acids that we know of, even the uncommon ones, all are built around this central alpha carbon. The alpha carbon, they refer to this as this chiral center, because remember the chiral center is the center atom that other parts of the molecule can rotate around. What's going to be rotating? The carboxyl, the amino, the hydrogen. Amino, alpha carbon, carboxyl. This is the set. What's behind here the, in the purple? That is what is labeled as an R group. Anytime you see in cell biology, you see in biochemistry, organic chemistry, a molecule that just has R there. That means that this is a side chain. A side chain will be there. And whatever side chain's there, that will tell you what this overall compound, this overall molecule is. This R group that's here, that's always going to be attached to the alpha carbon, that R group can be as simple as a hydrogen as we see in glycine, or it can be more um, complex, and we'll see that in a few slides. Now, we do need to keep in mind that orientation of everything here is important. Enantiomers are going to be an issue in a biological setting. LD, L-alanine, D-alanine. The difference is, well, orientation of the hydrogen and the amino. Now remember, I said that the alpha carbon gas is a chiral center where things can spin around. But the thing is, this isn't spinning around, okay? Because if the amino was here for it to have just spun around its chiral center, then right here should be the carboxyl. But since the carboxyl is still in line with the R group here, which is here a methyl group, then the hydrogen and the amino have swapped places. L-alanine, D-alanine. They are optically active, which means that if you were to bombard them with polarized light, remember polarized light just means that all the light, instead of being scattered in different directions, because remember it's a photon that's moving like this, so instead of the photons coming at you in different orientations, you're using gates filters to make it so that all the photons come in one direction only. You bombard L-alanine, D-alanine with this polarized light in a vacuum chamber. Well, once it hits these molecules, it will cause what was a vertical to now rotate counterclockwise or clockwise. L-alanine, D-alanine tells you which way does it rotate. L counter D clockwise. Because they have different shapes, they're going to have different functions. Because remember, I've told you pretty much every lecture since day one, shape dictates function. Different shapes, different functions. Well, what could be the difference in function L-alanine, D-alanine? One's recognized by atoms, recognized by ribosomes. The other won't be. Now, when we go and start looking at those R groups that I mentioned just before, you're going to see that like all scientists, we like to group like with like. So we group things based on certain char characteristics. One of the big ones is, does it play well with water? Hydrophilic, hydrophobic. Is it charged? Is it not charged? And when you go and you look at this table, 3.1 from the textbook, when they we list out all the different groups, nonpolar, hydrophobic, 
aromatic means it's going to be a ring, polar, hydrophilic, positive, negative charge means it's going to have ionic, thus hopefully ionic bonds at some point. You'll notice that the pK values fall within some set ranges. Okay, They're not all the same, but they fall pretty close. The thing is, when it comes to nature, everything you're going to see in nature starts as this spectrum. You see that, for the most part, everything is going to fall right here in this given range, an average. Okay, Nature really doesn't like extremes because extremes are hard to maintain especially in a cellular setting so while not everything is going to be exactly the same pk value you know pk1 pk2 value they're going to fall within this range when you average them out or you graph them out so when you go and you start looking at whoops didn't mean to do that so when you go and you start looking at the pk1 pk2 values of all of our amino acids, you will notice that they fall within you know, a range. Yes, there are some that are way out there, really low, really high, but they are exceptions to the rule. And when you go and you start looking at the different groups, nonpolar, notice nonpolar means no charges here. Now, I know a lot of students point out, well, there's a positive, there's a negative. Yeah, but this carboxyl, that amino, are going to be part of the peptide bond when this goes to form a polypeptide. It's these R groups that are going to be sticking out that are going to allow for interaction with other amino acids. Notice, no charges. It's going to be mostly carbon-hydrogen, mostly, you know, hydrocarbon-like. No charges, thus no affinity for water. When you want to look at the aromatic rings, you see aromatic rings, carbon, and rarely are there things off of them. Here's a hydroxyl. Here, carbon, carbon, double bond, and ooh, look, they put a nitrogen in there. But other than that, again, no charges. No places for an oxygen really to come be out there and hydrogen bond with things. So, these are also going to be considered hydrophobic. Our polar groups, though, well, this is something different. Our polar groups are going to have hydroxyl, mostly, or a carbonyl group that is going to want to hydrogen bond with other things. It's going to be available to hydrogen bond with other things, specifically water, thus it's going to be hydrophilic. You look here, hydroxyl, carbonyl, we know hydroxyls at specific pHs, the pK value here is going to mean that H is going to be let go. Thus, it's going to be O negative. This oxygen sticking out there, well, that's just begging to have hydrogen of a neighboring water molecule interact with it. Same with this amino group that's sticking out here, this nitrogen and hydrogen here, this amide. It's also wanting to hydrogen bond with the oxygens of waters flowing by. The positive charge, well, look, N plus, N plus. These are going to play very well with these. CO negative. And it's not the carboxyl group that's part of the base amino acid. No, this is in the R, the R group, where this carboxyl alpha carbon amino group is going to be part of the you know polypeptide chain holding things. This R group is going to be sticking off of the chain, able to interact. There's a negative. Previous slide, there was a positive. Now, as I said in... Uh, the introduction to this chapter, the previous lecture. Those 20 amino acids that we've gone over on the past few slides, yes, those are the common ones, but they're always going to be 
ones that are just, you know, uh, certain group specific, certain species or genus specific. For hydroxyproline, okay, you're going to find this in collagen. Only those of us animals that have collagen are going to have this one. Pyrolysine, you know, many others are going to be phosphorylated in things happening. Some of them are going to be, you know, intermediate metabolites. You know, it's part of a metabolic pathway that a certain amino acid is going to be altered and changed because it was a product for one enzyme and it's going to be the substrate for the next one. Well, just sometimes that, you know, intermediate product is going to be taken and utilized as part of our protein synthesis. As you hopefully remember from your organic chemistry, that the amino acids, their overall shape, their overall charge, is going to change based on what the pH of the solution it's in. Going to go from a nionic form, and as the pH changes, excuse me, it's going to become what is referred to as a Zwitter ionic. NH2 becomes NH3 plus. COOH becomes COO negative. They are now charged, but since there's a negative and a positive there, they are in balance. They are in this Zwitter ion form. Now, pH goes up, pH goes down, it will then revert to, and then, you know, the negative here, or it will revert to the positive here, depending on whether or not the pH is going up, pH is going down. The Zwitter ion is always going to be at the neutral pH, and what the neutral pH is going to be, it's going to be slightly different for each amino acid. Okay, it's not always going to be, oh, neutral means seven. No, there's it's going to be around seven, but it's going to be whatever the titration curve has shown for each of these amino acids. So when you go and you look, PK1, PK2. PK1 is where you go from, we think of as the positively charged amino acid because the pH is going up, it's, lot, it's gained hydrogen there. And this PK1 is where it goes from this positive to this Zwitter ion form. So it's a cation to a Zwitter ion. And that's going to remain a Zwitter ion up through till it here it hits here the PK2, where that extra extraneous hydrogen that was up there on the nitrogen is lost. And we now revert to an anionic form. This PI, the isoelectric point, this is where everything is truly in balance. This is where the Zwitter ion form is truly set so that the amino acid itself truly has a net negative charge. Okay, it's not, or I'm sorry, a net neutral charge, not net negative, net neutral. Sorry, mouth moving faster than brain. So even though there is a positive and negative charge there on the amino acid, they are in balance. Hence, the isoelectric point. Now, as we talked about in organic chemistry, and you see in the textbook, where these changes, this gain or loss of hydrogen, whether it's for an amino group or whether it's the carboxyl group for an individual amino acid, where that happens is going to be amino acid specific. Glycine, you see down here, pKa 2.34, where it gains or loses the hydrogen, depending upon whether or not the pH is going up or pH is going down. You know, you look over here for methylamine, 
down here for glycine, over here for acetic acid. It's going to be amino acid or it's going to be organic compound specific. So you can find tables of this where they have gone through and under set conditions have done these titration curves. You know, the titration curve and they can figure where and calculate where the PK1, PK2 values are occurring. The isoelectric point is going to be the true midpoint between PK1, PK2. So how do you figure that out? It's easy. You add them together. 9.6, 2.34. Add that, divide by 2. 5.97. Now these buffer regions, okay, this is where a hydrogen is either being released or taken up. And you find that it's kind of in balance as it's going from you know, the Zwitter ion form to the cation form to Zwitter ion form to the anionic form. In this buffer region for every one of these amino acids that's releasing, there's another that's taking up the hydrogen. So it's kind of in balance until some outside force starts to alter the pH, adding more hydroxyl. Boom, boom, boom. pH goes up, and now that buffering just can't compensate. Or adding in some acid to lower the pH, it can't compensate, and the pH will continue to drop. The isoelectric point, as I said, it's the average of pK1, pK2. This is where there is a true net zero charge. The amino acid is truly neutral. Any pH above that isoelectric point, well, it's going to have a net overall char negative charge. Anywhere below, it's going to be a net positive charge. <coughs> Here's the thing we have to keep in mind, that when it comes to amino acids, it's not always just the amino group, the alpha carbon, and the carboxyl group we have to focus on. Also have to keep in mind that there is an R group. That R group is also going to have its own pK value, where you know it goes from a zwitter ionic form to a negative or a positive charge, depending upon the R group. Hence, it has its own pK value, pK1, pK2, or the amino, the carboxyl, for the R group, it's pKa value, okay? It also is going to act, have its own little buffering in its own little buffering region along the titration curve, where it's at, how hard it's going to be, or how well it's going to be able to buffer and all that is going to be dependent upon what R group you're talking about. Whether you're talking something as relatively simplistic as glutamate, or something that's a little more complex as histidine with its own little aromatic ring. PKR here, 4.25. PKR here, 6.0. PKI value, or sorry, PI value for histidine. It's up here at 7.56 because you have to add all these up and average them out. PI value over here, the isoelectric one for glutamate. Add those three up, average them out. 